Good afternoon. Uh, this is Philippians 4, verse 1 to 7. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Alex. We're drawing near to the end of the book of Philippians, and I've been thinking about this journey. I hope you have been reflecting on the journey. I don't know what you've been thinking about Paul's letter and his messages. You know, you're... You're probably sitting here thinking, it sounds wonderful, but it feels so out of reach. Last week, we talked about pressing on towards the goal. You know, I want to know Jesus and his resurrection. And you hear that, and that's inspiring on Sunday, and you go back on Monday, and it doesn't seem like you're pressing on. It doesn't seem like you're running the race. And I, I get that. And last week, we read Paul's words about knowing Christ more deeply. And would you say that that is what you've been doing? Which you've been, have you been making progress in your knowledge of God? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, many of us probably say that they feel overwhelmed, maybe even discouraged. But here's what keeps striking me as I study this letter and as we study this letter together. Paul's heart beats with grace on every page. I think this might be the first time I'm saying the word grace in Philippians. And he doesn't mention it a lot. He only mentions it at the beginning of the letter and the at end of the letter. But the whole book of Philippians pervades with God's grace. You see, Paul isn't writing from this spiritual mountaintop. He's looking down on everyone else. Look at you peons, you know, in your middling life. Uh, there's a meme, I think it's called the Urban Dictionary. You're living mid, right? You're just average. That's not what he's doing, right? He's writing from a prison cell, and yet he's discovered something extraordinary. He's discovered a relationship with Jesus that has transformed everything. So Paul can say all of these things because he's not super spiritual. He's not some weird guy, like from another planet. He's like us, but he has experienced the grace of God. He can say this because God is super gracious. And so we're going to discover something beautiful. God invites us into an unshakable faith that can withstand life's strongest storms. This message, we're, we're closing in two parts, is a message of grace. All of these things, all these exhortations that Paul says, do not be anxious, rejoice, it's a response, it's an invitation from God to choose that way of life. And that's why I decided to call this, instead of seven choices, I renamed it last minute. <laughs> I do this all the time. My wife tells me, uh, you know, you need to make it less about us, less about our efforts, and more about what God does. So it's called Seven Invitations for Standing Firm. So Seven Invitations for Standing Firm. I'm not going to do all seven today, okay? I want to get to lunch. I want to eat, okay? So we're only going to do the first four today, four invitations to Standing Firm, and then we're going to look at the last three next week. So... God invites us to unity, God invites us to joy, verse 4, God invites us to gentleness, verse 5, and God invites us to peace, verse 6 and 7. So let's look at the first invitation. God invites us to unity. Okay. This, uh, let's look at verses 2 and 3. Uh, let me read this from this text. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sintke to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. 
What strikes me about this passage is how God works through real people with real struggles. There are two women, Yodia and Sitzke. We don't know who they are, but they're not just casual church members. These were women who had contended at Paul's side, worked together with Paul ever since the beginning of the church. My guess is they were close friends with Lydia. Lydia was the very first female convert of this church, and they probably were women who worked with Lydia. In our Korean context, Yodia and Sinke would have been Gwonsanims. Okay? I think our country, Korea, is the only country in the world where we made up this title for females and just called them Gwonsanims because we don't make them elders. So we just have this imaginary title. But I think there's something similar to that. They were dedicated servants. And they were struggling with some sort of conflict. Okay? It, I don't know what the conflict was. It probably had something to do, if we look at the book of Acts, many of the conflicts had to do with how we serve people. Who are we going to serve? So maybe one, Gwonsanim uh, Yuoidia said, we're going to serve the Gentiles in our church. Let's focus on the Gentiles. And Sintike said, no, 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 let's focus on the Jews and let's serve them better. Whatever it was, they were struggling and they were in conflict. And so the point isn't just pointing out the conflict, it's seeing how God creates a path for reconciliation. Notice how tender Paul is with these two. He doesn't shame them, right? He doesn't demand them, say, get over it, get over it. He, instead, he reminds them of their shared identity in Christ. Even in their conflict, notice he points out that both of them, look at verse 4, whose names are in the book of life. Both of you, Yodia, Syntyche, both of you's names are written in the book of life. You're going to live eternity together. So you should get along now. right? And so God still claims them as his own. And so God's invitation to unity isn't pretending everything is fine or avoiding each other. It's about discovering something profound. That the same grace that reconciles us to God can reconcile us to each other. And so when Paul says... Be of the same mind in the Lord. He's inviting them to see their conflict through the lens of Christ's love. So sometimes this journey toward unity feels overwhelming. And that's why I like how Paul, if you look at verse uh, 3 again, Yes, and I ask you, my true companion. We don't know who this person is, but Paul is saying, this person, maybe it's uh, gosh, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, why don't you help them in this conflict? Be a peacemaker in this conflict. But God doesn't expect us to handle conflict alone. He provides bridge builders and people who can help us take those first difficult steps toward reconciliation. So maybe some of you here today, you have someone in mind. Your heart feels heavy with some sort of unresolved conflict. Okay? That person you've been avoiding after church. Take a moment now. Let the Holy Spirit bring that person to mind. And as he does, receive this not as a burden to like, oh, I have to go and reconcile with this person, but as an invitation to the Father and asking God's grace to help you reconcile with this person. The second invitation, and let's say this together, the invitation to joy. Let's say that together. Invitation to joy. Yes, God invites us to joy. Listen to Paul's word in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Okay? Notice the repetition. It's like a father who is reminding his children of something precious that he wants them to remember, something that they might forget in the rush of daily life. And so Paul doesn't just command, be joyful. Be joyful, Claire. Be joyful, Philip. That's not how Paul is uh, saying it. He invites us to rejoice in the Lord. The Lord shares his joy with us. Right? This is crucial because God isn't calling us to manufacture joy through our own efforts. He's inviting us into his joy, offering us a share in his own delight. Right? Well, happiness comes, and we did a sermon on this. I think it was the very first sermon on Philippians, so I won't go into great detail. But if you'll remember, happiness is like a thermometer. Right? Your happiness goes up and down based on your circumstances. You get a promotion, yay, I'm happy. You get a demotion, I'm sad, uh, I'm not happy. But joy in the Lord is like a thermostat. What does a thermostat do? It sets the temperature. The temperature always stays there, no matter what, right? And so when Paul wrote those words from a prison cell, he's not saying, put on a brave face. 
you know, why so glum, sugar plum? Or what, you know, turn your frown upside down. He had discovered a secret that God's presence brings joy even in life's darkest valley. Okay? But let's be honest, this invitation to joy can feel almost impossible when life is hard. Okay? What happens when your medical test, you know, you get a cancer diagnosis and it comes back positive? When your business is struggling? When your children are wandering from the faith? Okay? God's invitation to joy isn't asking us to deny these very real pains and fears. He's offering us an anchor in the storm. So imagine, here's how you apply that personally. Imagine you're sitting in that doctor's office and you hear the words. The doctor says to you, I'm sorry, but the tests show that your cancer is malignant, right? In that moment, God isn't asking you to just put on a smile on your face. Instead, he's whispering to you, my beloved child, I know this is hard, but remember this diagnosis does not have a final word. I have the final word. Your identity isn't cancer patient. You are my treasured child, secure in my hands. Just as God walked with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through the fiery furnace, God promises to walk with you through every appointment, every treatment, every sleepless light. You do not have to face this alone. That is a kind of joy that God invites you into. So right now, wherever you find yourself, in a season of blessing or you're in a valley of shadows, God extends this invitation to joy with you. Not as a burden, not like be joyful, but as a gift. Come find your joy in me. Next, we're already making good progress. All right. The third choice or the third invitation, God invites us to gentleness. Let's say it together. God invites us to gentleness. God invites us to gentleness. In verse 5, Paul says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And I'll slow down now. Uh, the word Paul uses here is epiakes. Epiakes. And in other translations, it's called sweet reasonableness. That sounds really nice. Sweet reasonableness. Lovely phrase. Okay. And that should be the kind of gentleness that sweetens all of our interactions. Think about a person who has this kind of sweet reasonableness. You know, they're the person who, even when they agree with you, I'm sorry, when they disagree with you, they still make you feel heard and valued. They're firm in their beliefs, but never harsh. They know when to stand strong and not to bend. You know, they're like a skilled doctor that knows exactly how to touch the wound, firmly enough to heal the wound, but gently enough not to cause unnecessary pain. That's what it means to be at the Acus, gentle. Last year in our study of the Beatitudes, we talked about this in detail, right? We talked about blessed are the meek or blessed are the gentle. Uh, the best definition I heard of this is called power under control. Let's say that together, power under control. Okay. That's, that's gentleness. And I love how Barry Corey is the president of Biola University, a Christian school. He actually came to visit our school once. But he describes meekness or gentleness as having a firm center and soft edges. I love that. I hope all of us would be known for our firm center and soft edges. He's not asking us to become weak or to abandon our convictions or to be pushed over. Instead, he's showing us how to hold truth on one side and love together, just as Jesus does. He holds truth and love together. Right? So think of it this way. Let's use the metaphor of a mighty oak tree. A mighty oak tree has um, roots solid in the ground. Right, The trunk is solid, unmoving, representing our deep-rooted beliefs anchored in God's unchanging word. But the leaves, they'll sway in the wind, they'll dance, right? Gentle and welcoming to all who seek shelter beneath them. And this is how we are invited to live, firmly rooted in truth while extending God's gentle welcome to others. And here's a wonderful secret that makes this possible. Look at verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Right? The Lord is near. These four words change everything. He's near in his presence, right beside you in every situation, every moment. And he's near in his return, right? The Lord is coming back someday. 
So when you know the Lord is near, you can relax into gentleness. He's going to have the last word. He will vindicate you. You don't have to win every argument. You don't have to force your way. You don't have to defend your rights. Why? Because you're held secure in God's care. So think about where God might be inviting you to express gentleness. Perhaps it's with a family member who presses your buttons. Maybe it's an employee, employer who opposes your views. Maybe it's a stranger who cuts you off in traffic. Remember, you can afford to be gentle because the Lord is near. His presence makes it possible. His love makes it powerful. And His Spirit makes it natural. And finally, the fourth invitation, and this is the one I'm going to spend a little bit more time on because it's brand new. I've talked about gentleness already, talked about joy, but this is the first time we've talked about anxiety and peace. And so from gentleness, God perhaps extends his most tender invitation. God invites us to peace. Let's say that together. God invites us to peace. Verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We are all anxious. We all struggle with anxiety. And that word Paul uses for anxiety here is merimnao. And that word means a heart pulled in different directions. A heart pulled in different directions. And it's that overwhelming feeling that everything depends on us. That we are carrying the weight alone. But hidden within our anxiety, God plants an invitation. Every worried thought can become a reminder to him. So what I want you to do, anytime you feel that sense of anxiety, it's God's warning light for you to pray. That anxiety is a warning signal, signal, kind of like your check engine light in your car. The anxiety is your check heart signal uh, that God placed in you, right? So anxiety visits us all in different ways. You know, the parent lying awake, you're worried about your rebellious teenager. Our students here face anxiety when they uh, face their exams, their IB exams. Toby will know what that's like in April, right? Yeah, (laughs) and mock exams. And the business owner worrying about how they're going to pay their employees. And the single person wrestling with loneliness in the quiet hours, right? Each of these situations can spiral into those midnight what-if scenarios, right? What if this happens? What if this happens? That steals our sleep. But here's a beautiful truth. Every anxious thought is God's gentle invitation to turn to him. So God invites us to a threefold pathway to peace. These are the steps that you are to take when you have those anxious thoughts pulling at your heartstrings. First, he invites us into prayer. That word is prosukamai. Now, there are different words for prayer here that you'll have to know. So this word is to lay prostrate before the Lord. Right? Prosukamai means to lay prostrate before the Lord. So it's not rushing, just rushing into the petition part and telling him all your problems. But this has to do with marinating in who God is. Right, think about how a good Korean L.A. Kaldi marinade works. That's my favorite meat in the world, L.A. Kaldi, the long lengthwise strips. You have to marinate it for days, right? You don't just quickly dip the meat and then, no, you have to soak it in for 48 hours to let all those flavors penetrate deep inside. And that is what God invites us to do every time we enter prayer. Before you even mention your concerns, He invites us to rest in his sovereignty. Think about how God rules over everything. You trust his wisdom because God knows what is best. You remember his power because nothing is too hard for him. And you believe his faithfulness. He never abandons his children. So you do that first. You do the marinating in God's character. And then comes the petition, right? You have prayer and then petition. That's a different word. God invites us to bring every detail to him. And so instead of talking to our anxieties, right, or listening to our anxieties, one of my favorite pastors, Martin Lloyd-Jones, says, don't listen to your anxieties, talk to them, and talk to God about them, right? So God wants to hear our honesty. Lord, 
I'm terrified of this medical test. You tell God your feelings. I feel so inadequate. You tell him your vulnerability. I can't do this alone. And then you get, get to the specific needs. God, give me wisdom. Or God, give me strength. And finally, he invites us to thanksgiving. And that's what we're going to do today. Right? He, not after he answers. This is not about like, oh, prayer, and then wait 10 days, get an answer, and then you give thanksgiving. No, you thank him right away. It's not forced optimism. It's recognizing his faithfulness. Thanking that he is being with us right now as I'm going through this surgery. Right now as I'm going through this cancer diagnosis. You thank him for the promises that will hold true. For working even when we can't see it work. That doesn't mean that the answer will be what you want. But God will be with you through that prayer. And here's the promise. Verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 7. And the peace of God will guard your hearts. That word guard is fruiticide, and it describes a military garrison, a guard standing at the gates, right? So God's peace is like a team of soldiers that are stationed around your heart. All the anxieties, you've cast it on him, and then God sends a military guard, no more anxieties can enter. He'll block those uh, evil thoughts, okay? And so he'll pr protect you from runaway worries, paralyzing fears, and peace-stealing anxieties. This is not a peace that depends on circumstances changing, but it's a peace that comes from knowing that God holds you and your future. So let me share a practical example. If you're worried about a child, you would say, begin in God's presence. Lord, thank you for being the perfect father who loves my child even more than I do. You form them. You know their future. Your plans for them are good. And then you share your heart. Right? I'm worried about their grades. I'm worried about their friends. I'm worried about their choices. Please give them wisdom. Draw them close to you. Help me know how to guide them. And then rest in the thanksgiving. Thank you that you're already at work in their life. Thank you for your promise to complete what you've begun. And so let God send his military garrison of uh, the Holy Spirit to guard your heart. Okay? So hear God's invitation saying, come to me, bring it all to me. Let me guard your heart with my peace. So in closing, I just want to do a little activity. Okay, uh, We're going to have our hands out wide okay, like this. And we're going to ask God to give us the grace for whatever we need. Okay, God is inviting you to something. And you're going to receive the grace uh, of whatever it may be. It may be all four things. It may be one specific thing. So first of all, unity. Maybe God is inviting you to unity. Think of that person that you need to reconcile with. Who has God been bringing to your mind? Where is he inviting you into reconciliation? Healing? Okay. Grab it. Take it by grace. Give me the grace for that. Okay. Maybe God is inviting you to joy. Where is he inviting you to find your delight in him? Where is he inviting you to, uh, to find your delight in him, even in the midst of the darkest of circumstances? And then receive that grace with, uh, with grace. Receive joy. Uh, enter that joy by grace. And then gentleness. Maybe somebody is really uh, having, you're having conflicts with. With whom is he inviting you to share his tender strength, to reflect his heart of grace? And then he invites you to that and receive it with the grace. And finally, anxiety and prayer. What burdens is he inviting you to release into his caring hands? What anxieties is he asking you to entrust to him? So as God's Spirit highlights one of these invitations into your heart, Gently close your fingers around it. You don't have to do it noticeably or just in spirit, right? Not as a grip of determination, I'm grabbing onto it, but as a way of receiving God's grace. So this week, when you feel your hands, let it remind you of God's invitation to all of these things. Unity, joy, gentleness, and peace. And remember his promise. He says, I am near and we'll walk this path together. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, how amazing that you invite us into your life your joy, your gentleness, your peace. And we confess how often we try to walk this journey in our own strength, forgetting that you long to carry us through the whole Christian race together. Thank you for your patience that never ends, your grace that never runs dry, your love that never lets us go. Thank you that you're near, walking beside us, living within us, and coming again for us. And we wrap these holy desires that we place in our hands with your grace. 
Help us rest in your faithfulness rather than our own strength. Thank you that who, you who began at this good work will be faithful to complete it in all of our lives. In the name of Jesus, who invites us always into deeper life with him, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'll close by...